and um, uh, asking them to continue to bless them. We are really, really blessed to have them. Tonight, we have some combined groups, and it's right there on the, on the PowerPoint. Um, Demis Smith is with Judy Shoots on Demis's room, which is right across Judy's room. It's that big room over there, 120. Then Brenda Hutko, you're in the same hall. You just go a little bit further. And uh, Mary Jacobs is right there, 118. Um, and Noreen Kassner is with the media in room 157. So Brenda and Noreen are enjoying their brand new grandbabies. So isn't that exciting? And uh, so what a great thing to celebrate. Jeremy, you have something for us? Good evening. <clears throat> I'm still trying to fight this, but all's good. Um, did you know that BSF has six core values? We have a mission statement. We have six core values. And the first one is dependence on God. The most important one, right? Um, and it says that we rely on the inexhaustible, keyword inexhaustible, resources of God in the work of the power of the Holy Spirit for everything his work requires. Um, so that's how we depend on God. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't have anybody in my circle of friends that has inexhaustible resources, right? That means um, money, wisdom, power, strength, love, grace, mercy, all of those things. They might have an abundance of one, but the minute they use it, they deplete it. And God's resources are inexhaustible. And so anytime we do anything without dependence on God, it usually ends um, with a little frustration and a lot of ineffectiveness, right? Um, this is the time of year, though, when we start as mothers, as wives, just as women, we get slammed with things because the holidays are fast approaching. And oftentimes when that happens, we're tempted to lay down what God has asked us to pick up meaning BSF, meaning studying his word at home and then here in community. And I want to tell you that opposition will arise and challenge your commitment and your commitment to be here. But I want to encourage you to rely on God's resources, to step forward in faith and expect him to work out and to work through every conflict you have, because that's what we do. There's, you just can't even imagine the things that come up. And trust me, your faith will be strengthened as you do that. And you will see just how dependable God is. That means dependence on God when our kids are sick, when my car is broke down or it won't start, always happens on Monday night, when my boss asks me to work late, um, when I feel overwhelmed and there are not enough hours in the day, when I can't complete my lesson. Remind yourself that I will, that I can rely on God's inexhaustible resources in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what dependence on God is. So I want to encourage you tonight and in this season to make that a point to depend on God. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, the woman on the well, the Samaritan one who came to the well, she was thirsty, right? And uh, but when she got there, she received the living water. So she could not then help in counting that to herself. She had to share her gift uh, with others. So she came to the people around her in her city, in her village, and she told them, come, come and see, come and meet the one who redeemed my soul. Wow, what a great, that's her story. She told them her story. Well, we all have the opportunity to tell our story as well. So as we sing this hymn, I would like to invite you to stand up and worship our Lord Redeemer Jesus Christ with this beautiful and blessed assurance. What a certainty we have of this joy that makes us sing. So let's worship him. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Look up the door, there's the glory to come. 
joyful song yes it is a joyful song so we have a nice rehearsal let's move on to our second <laughs> second stanza let's do a little bit faster just to be a little more happier all right let's do it perfect Jesus, how wonderful it is to be lost in your life. But I pray that this song will continue to ring through in our hearts. And as we open your word, help us to understand the depths of your love, the depths of your kindness and grace towards us by redeeming us through your son. But I thank you for this lesson, and we trust that you will speak to us tonight. Open our hearts, open our minds, help us to put aside all the worries of the day. Help us to focus on you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I wonder how many water cups or water bottles, you know, those ceramic ones you have in your kitchen cabinets. In the quest for hydration, Americans got obsessed with water cups. So at coffee shops, at Target, Publix, Walmart, the variety and the quantity offered is endless. People pay up to $45 for a certain popular brand of cup that promises to keep the water fresh so you like it. That is even hydration apps to remind people to take a sip of water because water is essential to life. And actually, we will die after three days without water. But there is an even deadlier kind of curse in our world. It is a dehydration of the soul that we experience when we live a life without God. The world's offering to satisfy us, leave us, leave our souls parching, wanting for more love, more acceptance, more power, more pleasure, more provision, more purpose, more, more, more. But nothing satisfies. But there is a certain water, which is the only water that hydrates a dry cell, the living water. The rich and the famous need it, the poor and the lonely need it, the educated and uneducated need it, the religious person needs it, 
the unbelieving skeptic needs it. Every man, woman, teenager, children, young or senior adult needs it. And here's the good news. Jesus gave it freely, impartially, and eternally. In tonight's lesson in John 4, we will learn how Jesus gives us the living water in these two divisions. A thirsty soul, John chapter 4, verses 1 to 14. And then the satisfying Redeemer, John 4, verses 15 to 30. And we pray that we will learn that only Jesus' redeeming love satisfies our deepest needs. So let's open our Bibles, if you haven't opened yet, in John chapter 4. <clears throat> so, as we saw at the end of chapter 2, verse 24 and 25, Jesus was not motivated by man's recognition. recognition. Um, he would not entrust himself to man. God's plan and purpose was his motivation. And in chapter 3, verse 35, we learn that the Father had placed everything in his hands. So when he, here, at chapter, verse 1, of chapter 4, heard that the Pharisees um, uh, were, you know, already aware that he was attracting more followers than John the Baptist, so meaning the opposition was growing, he left Judea in the south and traveled towards the north the, uh, to Galilee because um, because he's in an absolute control of his hour that would come. Jesus alone has the power to lay down his own life and take it up, the Bible tells us. So he is firmly in charge, and that is why he makes a purposeful decision to depart to Judea. Verse 4 tells us, John says that he had to go to Samaria. See, Samaria was in between Judea, the south, and Galilee in the north. And so the fastest and logical route was to cross through Samaria. So many Jews, but actually not all of them, according to the first century historian Josephus, would purposely go around Samaria, especially the pious, the zealous, and our uh, most religious Jews. Because the Samaritans, though they have some Jewish heritage, they were seen by the Jews by a half-breed. Because back in the 7th to the 8th century before Christ, the Jews they were left behind by the Assyrians that invaded the land and took Israel captive. These Jews left behind, they intermarried over time with the occupying pagan settlers. And that fact, they worship of the one true God. So the Samaritans believed on the God of Israel, and they have even, they even held to the writings of Moses, but they also worshiped other little G gods and practiced a mixed religion that the Mosaic law condemned. So the Samaritans were also hostile towards the Jews. They believed their temple in Mount Jerusalem was the real temple instead of the one in Jerusalem, which they had opposed its building under Nehemiah and Ezra. Later, the Samaritans sided against Israel in the Maccabean Revolt. So there is a history of animosity between Jews and Samaritans. But Jesus is impartial. He knows that the Jews and the Samaritans are equally enslaved to sin, Wondering is spiritually dehydrated and in a desperate need of a savior. So he purposely goes through Samaria. There was a thirsty soul that he wanted to meet, a Samaritan woman. And he is willing to break all the rules about men or rabbis speaking with the women, rules about Jews speaking or sharing meals with Samaritans. And because he is impartial, he seeks out this unsatisfied, unsaved, sinful Samaritan woman. 
Well, God loved that Samaritan woman so much that he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to meet her. That God sent and gave shows his redemptive plan for us. God's heart for the Samaritan woman and for the world is his loving redemption plan for anyone who believes. He gave his son who took on flesh and really submitted himself to die a sinner's death to pay the price for our sins to purchase our eternal freedom and restore our relationship with the Father. With God's plan as his priority, verses 5 to 6 tells us that Jesus arrives at Sychar, or Sychar, a town in Samaria. And he sends his disciples to buy food in a town nearby, and then he sits at Jacob's well. So in a glorious picture of his deity alongside his indiscutable humanity, Jesus, the eternal word is really tired for the journey. So as John puts in his prologue, the word, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Verse 7 to 8 tells us that the Samaritan woman comes to the well to draw water. And Jesus asks her for a drink. Well, she's surprised and even mesmerized that Jesus not only speaks to her, but asks her for a favor. We know already about the Jews and Samaritans feud, but when, when Jesus, who doesn't have a, a bucket or a container, asks this woman for a drink, this would have required him to put his mouth on her defiled bucket. For the Jew, there was a huge no -no. But he is willing to make himself ritually unclean, according to the traditions, to meet her where she is. He cared for her life. She came and knew, it tells us, which was a not a usual or practical kind to draw on. Some suggest that she was an outcast even among her own people. So coming in was perhaps an attempt to hide from others. We all know how rumor, uh, rumors or whispers or judgmental attitudes can be hurtful. We really don't know the details why she seems to be an outcast. Perhaps, and during the heat of the day, it was all worth it, if that means avoiding the scorn of others. We never know the story behind a person. We never have the full picture. Only God knows. And Jesus knew her. But Jesus is impartial. And he is not influenced by people's opinions or perceptions. He's not even uh, uh, influenced by our own past. He knows this woman's life and gracefully seeks her. He asks for water, but his primary concern was her thirst, not his. In verse 10, he tells her after she's surprised, if you knew the gift of God and who is that ask you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. See, we got bored with water. We even, you know, add flavor to it. But then, water was not just important. It was not just important for life. Water was life. Hence, the patriarchs, like Jacob, would dig a well uh, right away when they were settling in the land. And that was the case uh, why J Jacob had the bad well. Though Jesus is speaking in spiritual terms, she takes his words literally and asks, uh, asks um, and wonder if he, perhaps he has a better water supply. So she says in verse 12, are you greater than our uh, father Jacob who gave us the well and drank from it himself as it also his sons and livestock? Well, gracefully, 
he clarifies, verse 13 to 14, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water well down to return eternal life. Jacob's well was no match for what Jesus was offering. The God who creates the hydrogen atoms and the oxygen H2O now sits thirsty at the edge of Jacob's well to give this one the living water that will satisfy her thirsty soul. She didn't know what her soul really needed, but he did. And because she mattered to him, he revealed it to her. What she searched all her life to quench her thirst soul was now being offered. Jesus wants to give her eternal life, a new life. The living water he is offering is the kind of water that becomes as satisfying as a well inside those who drink it, is bringing up God's own life, which has no end. Jesus knows our deepest needs, so he offered us living water. So the principle for this division is Jesus knows our thirst. Jesus knows our thirst. Have you stopped to think how profound this is? It means God took note of you. God chose you. You did not, you, you, did, you didn't do anything to deserve his favor, but he has set his affections on you and his hand on that woman. God has reached down he, has, he came near to us and made us his enemies, his friends, his children. Being known by God gives us comfort because it means he loves us and when we belong to him, he enables us to have true life through him. Later on chapter 10, he will say, my sheep hear my voice, I know them and they follow me. Jesus knows you. He knows your thirst. But is he the one who you seek to satisfy your deepest need? Let's see what the text teaches about this satisfying redeemer. And that's our second division. So Jesus is the living water that satisfies our thirsty souls. So how do we get it? How do we get it? Well, the woman is curious too. So she says to him, verse 15, Sir, give me this water so that I will not get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So he again clarifies and told her, Call, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, You are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is, you had had five husbands, and the man, the man now have um, you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. <coughs> Jesus seems blunt. Perhaps you know we would say a little harsh, you know, in bringing her thoughts up, right? If he cares so much, we may ask. Why drudge this step up, up on her face? Here's the thing. Jesus cannot satisfy our thirst until we have the root of our satis unsatisfaction exposed. Jesus was not shaming her. He was saying she did not have to hide in front of him. The same is for me and for you. If Jesus had not exposed her life, she probably would not receive this offer because she would think she would think that uh, it didn't apply to her. She would think, 
He's offering this because he doesn't know me. But he knew her. He knew that she was paralyzed in the present by the shame of the past. We are the woman in the well. We leave the core of our dissatisfaction exposed. The truth is that without Jesus, we are crippled by the guilt and shame of our sins. But God does not expose our shame, our sin to shame us. He wants us to know that in our brokenness, his offer of living water that he gives us still stands. Like Adam and Eve, we hide because of the guilt and shame we experience because of sin. But God intentionally comes to meet us. Our past does not alter his gift of grace. Nothing in your past is bad enough to alter the intensity of his love for you. So to taste living water, we have to face the reality of our sins. So she responds, Sir, I can see that you are a prophet. And then she says, our ancestors worship on this mountain, but you Jews claim to have played uh, that, uh, that the place where it must be in Jerusalem. Well, Jesus exposes sin and the woman starts to talk about worship. So it might seem that she was deflecting attention from her past. But along with some Bible scholars and commentators, may I suggest that her response is proper. See, Jesus exposed her guilt and shame, and she began to defend herself by pointing to her piety. Then and today, we try to fix our sin problem with our own solutions. Being a good person, being pious and religious, attending church, attending Bible study, having a certain political view. But listen, Jeremiah 2.13 says, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and we know that spring of living water is life, is, is a life, life thing. And they have dug their own cisterns. See, cisterns are man-made things. They are man-made reservoirs, and, and they are sediment. There is sediment water in it. And they are broken cisterns, he says in Jeremiah, that cannot hold water. So the reason for our thirst is that we've forsaken our God, the rule of in his authority of our lives, and we have dug our own cisterns, but they are broken. They are stagnant. They don't work. They are not working. Religion does not work. Good morals will not work. Education, relationships, career, status, money, nothing. Nothing like that will work. So in love and grace, Jesus draw her to understand. And in verse 21 to 24, he says, Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet, a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The time of worshiping God is in a, sing, in a single location, is over, he's telling her. He himself is the one to be worshipped. Just a couple of weeks ago, we studied about the temple cleansing, and Jesus is pointing to himself as the new temple. So the Jews had been giving the truth, but they were lost and did, so, and did not worship as God wants them to worship. The Samaritan had only half of the truth, and they were also lost, so they did not worship God as he should. But Jesus exposes hearts to the Father. God, Jesus exposes the heart of the Father. 
God was looking for two worships. God was looking for her. This is the essence of love. God lacks nothing, my friends. He does not need us at all. In the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, God is fully satisfied. God is fully satisfied in himself. They are in themselves, Father, Son, and Spirit, full of joy, and they themselves are fully glorified and satisfied. He does not miss anything, and yet, look at this. He wants something. The Samaritan, Nicodemus, you and me. Why? Because it is his joy to sovereignly invite us into his own glorious life. He wants us to worship in his spirit and truth because that's what we need, not him. Worshiping God in spirit and truth is not something we create. No, it is an invitation to step in and dwell in his glorious life. To worship in spirit in truth is a picture of what happens when we are filled and overflowing with the living water. To worship in spirit in truth we refuse to, means that we refuse to go through the motions. We are not motivated by duty or obligation but by love and gratitude to God. It is a joyful overflowing. Worshiping spirit in truth is a surrender to the authority of who God is as revealed in his word. So no matter how offensive that might be to the culture, worshiping spirit in truth is not woke. Worshiping spirit in truth overflows from a life that tasted the living water. So Jesus is not waiting for our tears or for our good or better works. He is waiting for us to behold him. So when the Samantha woman says in verse 25, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus says to her, I the one is speaking to you, I am he. Jesus is the perfect revelation of the heart of the Father. He see, to see him is to trust him and to believe that he is the Son of God, sent to redeem us back to the Father, by setting us free from our sin through his death on the cross. It is to behold him. It is as we ask him, when we ask him for living water, because only Jesus' redeeming love satisfies our deepest needs. It is delightful. So um, it is delightful to see how the disciples felt really confused in verse 27 when they came back and saw Jesus talking to this woman and to see the contrast with this woman's excitement uh, leaving so fast that her water jar was left behind, which is a picture that she's not in need of it anymore since now she's overflowing with the living water. She had encountered the truth and the truth has set her free. The woman who is hiding from others, now to, uh, when she came to fill her water jar at the well, now she leaves with the living water welling up from within her. Ransomed by her Savior, she goes and shares her story of her Savior with others. The one through God knows her, so her thirsty soul is now healed. So he came near to her. He sat by her, giving the living water that she that would redeem her sins and set her free from death to life. Her soul was thirst no more. She found living water. Actually, living water found her. So ladies, our truth from this division, from these verses, 
Only Jesus, redeeming love, satisfies our thirsty soul. Only Jesus' redeeming love satisfies our thirsty soul. Only Jesus can give us the living water that brings the Father's life into our hearts and soul. When we ask Jesus for the living water, he redeems our past, our sins are forgiven. His Holy Spirit is strengthening us to reject so we can reject the foolish ways of this life. He came and he sat by the well that would only temporarily satisfy our thirst to give us the living water, the ultimate satisfaction that we need. John Piper says, we are never more satisfied when then God, then when God is most glorified in our lives. What about you? Whether you are a religious leader, concealing your shame, whether you are broken hearted, maybe you feel like you, you are you are social outcast, looking in the wrong places for satisfaction. Whether you are rich or poor, respected, despised, educated, upright, rebellious, believer or unbeliever, Jesus came for you. Our deepest need only Christ can meet. He is the, he, here is the life, um, life and death question that you need to ask. It's the most important question. Do you know this gift? And do you know the one who gives? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming and meeting us where we are. We were lost in our transgressions, filled with shame and guilt from our sins. We were condemned with no way out, but you came and you met us and gracefully you gave us the living water, eternal life that starts right now and will last for all eternity. Thank you. Thank you for saving us. And I pray, Father, that you help us to remember this truth, to have this truth as the foundation for the perception that we have of this world and the circumstances we live in. Help us to trust you with our lives and to demonstrate that to those around us, so they too can come and meet you and find the living world. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Thank you, friends.